would like, uh, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name's Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker. Licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Tours. But please, don't hold that against me. Welcome to the beginning of another week, folks. I hope you had a fantastic weekend. If you'd like to reach out, please feel free to visit therebelbroker.com. From there, you can click on the contact menu and uh, send me a message with any ideas, suggestions, observations, or questions that you might have. From there, you can also click the big red button at the top of the page titled Take the Survey to Support the Show. Once you do that, just answer the questions. There'll be about a, there'll be a handful of questions to answer. Plus, it'll ask for your email address two separate times. Use the same email address both times. And not only will you be helping the show, but you'll also be entering yourself in to win a $50 Amazon gift card. We've already given this out five times. That's $250. Bucks. Uh, we've been doing it at the beginning of each month. So there is time for you to get in there and get your information submitted before March uh, when we will do this again and potentially hand out yet, well, not potentially, we will hand out another $50 Amazon gift card that could potentially be given to you. So congrats to the folks who've won already. Good luck to the folks who've gone to the trouble of clicking that little red button and answering the questions uh, to winning it the next time around. Uh, this was actually the first weekend I was able to kind of step back a little bit. As you know, I'm preparing my property uh, for sale, kind of pursuing a bunch of different strategies, but each weekend has sort of been consumed with prepping, doing all the things I suggest you do when you're preparing your home for sale, packing up all the things you don't absolutely need. As I've mentioned in previous shows, we don't sell our house the same way we live in our house. It com- changes your whole day-to-day routine. It can be a big pain in the butt, but it does pay off. So in my case, all the tchotchkes are going away. Uh, anything I don't absolutely need, anything I can't If I can live without it for the next six months, it gets packed up and goes into storage or it gets tossed. Uh, So everything remains kind of sort of on schedule. We did have a couple of delays that I also mentioned here on the show. I'll give you, excuse me, any updates as big things come along. Uh, And as I mentioned last week, I continue to do battle with whatever this long term diseases that's floating around. I've bumped into quite a few folks who have it, but it just seems to hang on. I think I'm on week three or four. It seems to go away a little bit and then comes back, but I'm, I'm fighting the good fight. Uh, so hopefully this will be a uh, uninterrupted week for us. I have some news. <laughs> it's not a great way to start your week. It's not fantastic news. Uh, I also have a top 10 list from realtor.com that we, that we may get to today. Uh, we may not, depending on how long we end up discussing these other news items. Well, we'll cover it either today or tomorrow. Uh, But before we jump into that, uh, I wanted to hit some news that I think fits in well with things we've talked about to sort of bring everybody up to speed. One of the things that concerns me, one of the things that I'm tracking is indebtedness, right? Because if we want to learn lessons from bad things that have happened in the past, we need to try to understand what things are similar to other things. So while last time real estate was absolutely front and center of our downturn, you could very easily envision a scenario where perhaps real estate isn't at the center of things going wrong, but would absolutely get sucked in if something else went wrong. And one of the things we've been looking at here on this show is folks, the the indebtedness of folks, how much debt are people carrying? Um, And we've talked about a lot of different numbers. We've talked about how lending has been leaning more and more towards doing the exact same thing as it did last time. And by exact, I mean the results are the same. Last time, uh, if you had a low credit score, we simply said that low credit score is okay. This time around, we're sort of stacking the deck so that credit ratings are getting artificially boosted 
and there's really not an argument on this. I've had a couple of listeners who've, who've contacted me about this subject. And it's not even really a debatable thing because when you read the the informational releases on these moves that they make regarding how they're calculating uh, credit, one of the specific goals is to open credit to more people. Well, if you're if you're opening credit to more people, that's that's already not necessarily a good thing, right? We've already talked about how there isn't enough inventory to satisfy current demand. So by simply fooling with that, that side of the equation, all you do is raise prices, right? Increase the level of demand for anything, whether we're talking about oranges, apples, widgets, cars, whatever. If you can't increase the inventory to to meet the demand, the price goes up because of, of scarcity, right? There's fewer of them. There's more individuals per thing that want them. So as people stand there and try to get their hands on their very own, they will outbid the person standing next to them. That's how it works. So whether you want to make an argument of whether we should or shouldn't be taking steps to expand the number of people who qualify for a mortgage, and I'm, going to fr- I'm phrasing it that way very specifically. I guess some people may be hemming and hawing about that, but when, when those words are spoken by folks in the government or folks at FHA or Fannie or Freddie or in banks, they're talking about making it easier for folks who normally would not qualify to qualify. It's, you can't make the argument that it somehow now includes more people who were already qualified. If they were already qualified, they would have already qualified. So it's redefining what qualified means. Now, you can, you can also further analyze whether or not that is correct. Are the new things they're doing sane things? Are they things that reasonably make sense in terms of anticipating someone's credit worthiness or financial maturity to maintain payments or balance their budget? You know, those sorts of things. I suppose you can have that discussion. Uh, but even if you want to have that discussion, if we focus on outcomes it still creates more buyers regardless. I would argue that it doesn't, it doesn't create more qualified buyers. It creates more challenged buyers, buyers who are more likely to have trouble dealing with this level of debt. So I think that adds a level of risk. Even if you don't believe that level of risk is present, I don't think that you can argue that it doesn't artificially increase prices because it artificially increases the sheer number of buyers. Okay. And we've talked about a bunch of other items. If you've, if you've been listening to this show for a while, you, you know them. If you haven't been listening, you can go back. And, and some of you have also noticed that uh, shows now have an expiration on them in terms of the feed. Uh, this is really just to keep the feed healthy. If you want to find old shows, you can probably best locate them at the website at therebelbroker.com. Uh, and yes, there will be a search feature coming to the website. Someone was very kind to point out that, you know, I went looking for an old show and I couldn't find it. They're all just there in a list. I'd have to scroll down everything. So I'm going to uh, add a search feature there, uh, which probably should have been done a long time ago, but it will be there soon. So don't worry. Uh, you'll be able to search very soon on these. Uh, but there were several news items that came across last week. And they really jump out at me for a couple of reasons. One, they fit in perfectly with what we talked about in terms of just paying attention to the debt scenario. What's what's going on with people in terms of managing their debt? And the other thing that concerns me is an awful lot of this feels a whole lot like 2005 and 2006. It just rings a bell. So for those of you who were old enough to remember all of that stuff, I get that that was... Uh, over 10 years ago now, so so some of the younger folks listening may have been kids or may not have been out of high school or may not have been out of college at the time and maybe aren't weren't as much plugged into those kinds of day-to-day worries. For those of us who were, you know, doing what we do every day, going out and kind of chasing our careers and all those sorts of things, and or who paid attention to these kinds of headlines or these kinds of concerns, uh, you really couldn't have done it paying attention to the headlines. A lot of the headlines really didn't even mention this stuff, but If you were hearing a lot of the after things went wrong explanations, so much of this should sound familiar. So let's let's go ahead and go down the list. Um, The New York Fed reported that household debt has increased substantially and has begun and has almost reached the previous peak. And that's concerning. And I want you to keep that in your head, because in addition to listening to me, whatever else you're listening to, whenever you 
see a chart or you hear someone report a number and they're giving you the context of it relating to just before the downturn, or you can see that the date on that is right around the downturn or right when things were really bad during the very down market, that should worry you. Those aren't places we really want to be again. And I'm not just talking about when things went wrong. I I think it's also important to keep in mind, we don't want to be in the same situation as we were just before things went wrong. Just like we don't want to be on the Titanic just before it hits the iceberg, right? All the circumstances that lead up to bad things, those are not circumstances to envy. Those are circumstances we should try to avoid. So kind of try to keep that mindset as you hear this and also as you hear news from whatever sources you tend to look at other than this show. All right. So this is from Calculated Risk. And as I said, household debt has increased uh, to almost previous levels. Uh, The Federal Reserve Bank of New York today issued its quarterly report on household debt and credit, which reported that total household debt increased substantially by $226 billion, that's a 1.8% increase, to $12.58 trillion during the fourth quarter of 2016. Now, that's the largest quarterly increase in total household debt since the fourth quarter of 2013, and debt today is now just 0.8% below its peak of $12.68 trillion, uh, which uh, was reached in the third quarter of 2008. Now, what's more concerning about this is, is it's not even in one specific area. This is debt in all areas that they measure. So a 1.6% increase in mortgage debt, a 1.9% increase in auto loan balances, a 4.3% increase in credit card balances. That one worries me. Um, that's the highest number in here, and credit card debt is the worst kind of debt. Uh, For a variety of reasons, it's the worst kind of debt, not the least of which is the ridiculous interest rates that are charged. So if debt is jumping up by a whopping 4.3% in credit card balances, that's a big concern because that's, I consider that in in terms of debt toxicity, that's right up there uh, and really only a notch or two below the type of loan you take where if you don't make a payment, you get your legs broken. Uh, So that's a bad thing for me. And then finally, a 2.4% increase in student loan balances. Um, This boost, according to them, was driven in part by new extensions of credit, large increases in the volume of mortgage originations, and a continuation of the strong recent trend in auto loan originations. Uh, Let's see, what else? This quarter saw the lowest number of bankruptcy notations in the 18-year history of this series, continuing an overall downward trend since the financial crisis. But we've got another headline that is a little concerning relating to that. And let's jump into that one next. So that there's, there is reference item number one, right? Insane amounts of debt. Where were we just before the last downturn? Now, the last time, a huge amount of the debt that we were incurring was relating to homes. A huge amount of it this time is relating to homes as well, as noted here. A lot of it was related to mortgage originations, those sorts of things. But it was also very toxic credit card debt. Credit card debt was also seeing a big bulge last time as well. Two things that coincide with past bad experience that I think is worth stopping and thinking about and being concerned about. So next, from the folks at Zero Hedge, for the first time since the first quarter of 2013, mortgage delinquencies rose quarter to quarter in in, in quarter four. The jump from 4.52% of total loans to 4.8% is the largest since the first quarter of 2010 and has hit mortgage rates rates spiked following President Trump's election and Fed Chair Yellen's job boning and rate hike. Um, Now, levels remain low relative to the extreme highs of the financial crisis, but this is a trend worth noting. When you see something where it, it, it isn't increasing, things aren't going up, and when you hear all of these other things, right? we're being sold this idea a, of a much stronger economic outlook. This isn't what you see in an era of dramatically increased economic outlook. You can't chalk this up to seasonal. Um, we saw dramatic decreases that uh, we saw a good size dec- decreases on par with the increase we saw this year, the same time uh, last year. Um, so it, it's a concern for me. Um and I think it sets a stage 
where we could potentially see a continuing decline in the overall economic situation that we're in. Now, what's concerning about that is that that is a set of circumstances that could feed a lot of different things going wrong, not just real estate. My concern is that if one thing does go wrong, it's likely to bring down real estate as well, just like real estate brought down so many other things when it experienced a downturn. So are these just two isolated things? No, they obviously work in concert, but there's one more thing that I think we need to talk about. Um, Rates are higher. Inflation is surging. The Fed is talking about raising rates, which remember, We've talked about as far as, far as the, there's the, the better relationship between what you pay for a mortgage is more linked to 10-year treasuries rather than the, uh, the Fed raising rates. And real wages are dropping. And let's cover that because we've got another article relating to that subject. My concern is that we're seeing so many different things coming together that given those realities – it may be a circumstance where we need to start thinking about managing our investments in a way that get ready for bad things to come, potentially by the middle of this year, middle to late of 2017. Now, we're going to go ahead and cover this. We're going to cover this, this other story I'm referring to, but first, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Are you ready to jump in and start your search for your first investment property? Maybe you've decided that it's time to own your own home, or maybe you're ready to sell your home and move on to something new. No matter what your goal is, The Rebel Broker can help. That's right. Aside from hosting this show, I am also the owner broker of White Lawn Sons Real Estate Services right here in Silicon Valley. With over 25 years experience serving Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy, I or one of my great agents can help you achieve your goals in real estate. So if you're ready to look into taking that next step towards achieving your real estate goals, point your browser at www.soldbyrobert.com. That's www.soldbyrobert.com. Robert.com and get in touch. Let me show you how I will earn your business and your respect. Again, that's www.soldbyrobert.com or you can call me at 408-852-0525, California Bureau of Real Estate ID 00984909. Welcome back, everyone. You got to fasten your seatbelt for today's show. We're basically running down some data points in the economy that I think are worth not only thinking about, but making plans based on uh, and gauging our expectations in terms of what we can expect from the world of real estate down the road. Um, And, and, you know, so I want to try to give you some takeaway. I, I usually don't like to just share these numbers with you and say, have fun. I usually try to go with what I would do or what I would suggest to clients if I'm seeing data like this. And we'll go through that. Um, I don't, I don't believe there's ever a time I just to, this is kind of thrown right in the middle of the show, but I don't think there's ever a time when you just step away and say, I'm not, I'm out, I'm not in. I, I think that if you understand what's happening and you're able to anticipate it, you are in a position to take actions that let you find a successful path, even under those circumstances, right? Whether It's you getting super creative and getting involved in investments that bet on a downturn on X, Y, or Z. It's not really my thing, but if that's your thing, great. If you are an investor who buys real estate, flips real estate, does that sort of things, maybe that means that in your planning, you simply need to give you a yourself a what if cushion, maybe an extra percent of percentage points that you think are important in order to weather a downturn and how much you think that downturn might affect an investment that you're making. Being forewarned is forearmed, right? So it helps you make smarter decisions and maybe helps you decide whether or not you need to pass up this deal that you've just come across or maybe be a little bit more aggressive in the negotiations. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in. As I mentioned, I had a a third article here um, title Consumer Prices Surge at Fastest Pace in Five Years as Real Wages Tumble. Now, this is all a scenario that isn't exactly one-to-one what was happening before the last downturn, but it recreates the circumstances, right? So how does it do that? Well, 
back when things were, were happening before the downturn, wages were doing relatively well. We were seeing people making a lot of money. We had folks with careers uh, of a different type. Back then, uh, in terms of the employment situation, we had uh, more of a career-related job. There was, there was healthcare benefits. Jo- wages tended to be better. Now, the, the problem today is that so many of those jobs have been replaced with service industry jobs and folks who are holding on more than one job. So that's a concern, right? But when we calculate the differences between, we're creating the same debt kinds of burdens, the same stresses that are just arranged in a slightly different way. Last time, we may have had much bigger debt, particularly related to housing um, and the loans that were being taken out because the 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 uh, value to loan ratio was off. We, we weren't really doing a lot of the pr- prudent things in terms of establishing what type of loan made sense on a given property. Everyone was sort of living off of this idea that properties do nothing but go up. People getting 110% loans with, with relatively small amounts of money down. So we were, we were embracing this much larger debt scenario, but people were making more money. Today, maybe the debt scenarios we're embracing aren't as aggressive. They aren't crazy. They're not at 110%, right? But we're still seeing folks putting down as little as 3.5%. In some areas, 0%. They're still expected to put more down than they were before. But in relation to what they're making, my argument is, is that we're creating a debt scenario where if we look at it in terms of just ratios of one to the other, that it carries, I think, the same kind of danger. Just like we've sort of rigged the estimation of creditworthiness by changing the credit ratings so they're calculated differently to include more people, which generally does the same thing that got done last time. It creates more buyers, right? So my point is that while there's not a 100% one-to-one analogy between things that led up to what what went wrong before, so much of them deliver the same results, deliver the same ratios of indebtedness for people, those types of things. But let's get into these numbers. We've already talked about several scary numbers in the last two stories. Um, The consumer price index... It's up 2.5% year over year, the most since March of 2012, driven by a 14.2% year over year spike in gasoline prices. Um, Real average wage earnings plunged by 0.6% year over year, the biggest wage collapse since November of 2011. Um, Now, these are all from a report, um, which I want to try to include the link to. I I can definitely include a link to the story that's talking about it. I always like to give you as much information as I can for you to, to backtrack and check for yourself. But let's just sort of run through this. That This article has gone through the, the trouble of listing out for us uh, some bullet points, some things that are, that are big items. Um, now, and don't think that this is just us, right? This is not something that's just an American thing. It's also happening in Germany. It's happening in China. It's happening in a lot of European countries. This, this uh, inflation scenario is kind of a global one. But some details from the report. First item, the food index rose 0.1% in January, its first increase since April of 2016. Um Number two, the energy index rose 4% in January, its fifth straight increase. The gasoline index continued to rise, increasing 7.8%. The index for natural gas also increased, rising 1.5% in January. The index for energy increased 10.8% over the past year, with all of its major components rising. The gasoline index rose 20.3%, and the index for natural gas increased 10.1%. Now, why is that important? Well, because typically we already talked about food. The ener- food and energy are two things that they don't like to put into inflationary uh, numbers. So when they when you're talking about a well, let's say you're at work and you're getting a cost of living increase, the number that they take doesn't include food and energy; it includes other things. They stopped including those because it was screwing up the number for them. So these are real numbers. Uh, If we wanted to look into more detail on the food index, the index for, uh, let's see, meats, poultry, fish, and eggs, which had declined for 16 consecutive months, rose 0.7% in January as the index for eggs rose 14.3%. The index for other food at home also rose in January, increasing 0.2%. Now, why are these two things important? A, you cannot eliminate these from your life. These are not things you can go without. You may be able to cancel cable 
Uh, you may be able to cancel subscriptions to things. Maybe you stop paying someone to come and do in your lawn and you start doing it yourself. There are things we can absolutely trim from our lives. But when we see a scenario with rising indebtedness and we see s- situations where things are slowing, and, that, and one reason why I, uh, why I like to cover different areas of real estate in terms of areas that are being negatively affected is because it shows us that there are areas that do get negatively affected that are slowing down. Um, there was a article from realtor.com that talked about the most toxic neighborhoods, uh, the most toxic uh, zip codes across the country. That's kind of an interesting read. I'm not sure we'll cover that on today's show. I don't think we'll have time, but I can include a link to that as well. Um, so you put all of these together, you put all the items we've talked about, whether it's mortgage delinquency rates starting to go up. Well, that indicates an element of stress on the part of consumers, right? On the part of everybody else who lives around us. They're having to make choices about what they pay. They can't make a, ch- they, they, their food is getting more expensive. Their energy is getting more expensive. Their actual household income, as we discussed in another article, has gone down. So where do they make those trims? Where do those things start to happen? This is what led up to the downturn last time. When people have to start making the hard decisions, what stops getting paid? Now, there was a time maybe when the mortgage wasn't way up on that list, when maybe the last thing you'd stop paying would be your mortgage. I don't think that's true anymore. And I think that our experience in the last downturn showed, because these are what all the headlines were saying, Folks could stop making their payments and they could potentially extend their stay in that home without paying their mortgage for over three years. There were plenty of examples of that, right? We had examples of folks who continued to pay their mortgage and keep it current, but then bought another home nearby and moved into that. Of course, that only happened after the downturn, once prices started to go down. So here's something that fits in with this. It's not mentioned in any of these articles, but it's something bouncing around in my head that really has me concerned. I think that one thing that could really spell disaster is this scenario con- continuing. Current debt levels, in, uh, stay, even just staying where they are, but tending along in this, in this same curve of going up. Continuing to see food and energy co- costs going up. And suddenly we see a downturn in home values. I honestly think that from the standpoint of folks out there in the world who are looking at the, in, the economy and what's going on with it and what their personal situation is as it relates to debt and how much money they're making per month to pay that debt, I think seeing property values in their level, in their area declining will incur a level of concern that will have us right back where we were when things started to go nuts last time because I, I believe that we'll start to see a return of what happened before. As soon as prices go down enough. Now, what is that number? We've talked about it before. We've, we've explained that if you've bought something within the last year, the odds are that if you went to try to sell it, that, that once you closed escrow, if you bought something within the last year, you are underwater unless you put 20% down, right? If you, bought, if you bought using an FHA loan, if you did your 3.5%, the minute you closed escrow, you were in negative territory. Because remember, you're going to have to pay a real estate agent a commission. You're going to have to pay transfer taxes. You're going to have to pay county tax. You're going to have to pay city taxes. You're going to have to pay escrow fees. You're going to have to pay title insurance. These are all things that you're going to have to pay if you decide to sell your house, which means once everything's balanced out at the end, you have to write a check to someone when you sell your house. Now, no one I think in the real world is doing that math. But as soon as we start to see markets that have, have home, had homes purchased in that way, start to decline. And once it starts making headlines, if we start to see the same reactions to that that we saw last time, we are setting the stage for the exact same problem. And I, I, I think that's a, not only a real possibility, I think it's a huge concern because it could absolutely be a repeat of the downturn we experienced last time. Okay, Let's go on. There's, there's several more points to this report. Again, head over to therebelbroker.com for show notes so that you can check out this article for yourself. See if I'm, if I'm calling it wrong or I shouldn't be concerned about these things. 
Uh, so number three on this item is the shelter index rose 0.2% in January after increasing 0.3% in both November and December. The rent index rose 0.3% and the index for owner's equivalent rent increased 0.2%. The apparel uh, index rose in January, increasing 1.4%. Number four on this list, the index for new vehicles rose 0.9%. It's the largest increase since 2009. The index for motor vehicle uh, insurance continued to rise, increasing 0.8%. And the index for airline fares rose 2%. The used cars and trucks index was one of the few to decline in January, falling 0.4% after increasing late in 2016. Finally, The medical care index also rose in January, increasing 0.2%. The index for prescription drugs and for hospital services both increased 0.3%. The recreation index increased 0.4%, the largest advance since January of 2012. The index for household furnishings and operations rose 0.3% over the month. The alcoholic beverages index increased 0.2%. And the indexes for tobacco and for personal care both rose 0.1%. So you can check out this list yourself. It, It lays out... Um, sort of the month-on-month increases on various, it's, it's, it's useful data to kind of look at. But the point is, what stage does this set for us? Is it realistic, realistic to be concerned? And we also need to remember that, while I think these are scary numbers, just like areas tended to be hit a whole lot less last time, I think that's also true This time, I think there are other areas that are likely to be hit far more areas that have seen the biggest, biggest increase are likely to be the ones to hit hardest and first. It's kind of what happened last time. Uh, Places like San Francisco are kind of a weird one. It's I, I, there were plenty of opportunities in San Francisco last time. Um, we'll have to see how that plays out. I think areas like where I am have a high potential to get hit. Basically, once you start heading further south, once you're in sort of the heart of Silicon Valley and head away from it, I think things t- tend to get hit. The only other thing that I'd want to check that would really concern me about these numbers is the employment numbers. And not just the percentage. I'm I'm really no longer interested in the percentage. I want to know in my areas. I want to know are companies doing things that indicate they're going to be hiring or are they going to be standing pat? Because here's one of the things that's happening that has me concerned. All the big companies are holding on to their cash. Uh, I had a client uh, who had to stop searching about a month ago because they got laid off from a high-tech company. Interesting that that happened at the beginning of January. Um, so I'm I'm a little I'm a little concerned. Uh, I think you should be as well, or at least take this information and decide for yourself if you think it's going to have a big impact on your local marketplace. Look for the realities of these numbers reflected in your local marketplace and see what kind of an effect you think they'll have. Uh, in my marketplace, there are definitely areas I'm not interested in buying. Um, I, you know, I'm sort of steering away from. I don't think buying in San Francisco makes makes much sense. Um, there are parts of Santa Clara and Sunnyvale that I don't think buying makes a whole lot of sense. I actually think that given the amount of apartments that are going to come online this year, may, we may start to see a big challenge to single family residential rentals simply because people are going to want to reduce their expenses. If you're already in a rental scenario and we are seeing the cost of food, cost of energy, existing costs of shelter, vehicle costs, all of these various costs going up, the trim those folks are likely to make is going to be to move into less expensive housing, and that could mean moving back into an apartment scenario. So it'll be interesting to see how these things evolve. I'm going to keep my eye on this stuff, particularly in my local market. I like to be very tapped into what's going on with my local market. And hopefully this information will spark in you uh, at least the idea of what to look for in your local markets to figure out how much of this should concern you and how to structure your deals or what sort of deals to look for that are going to be resistant to these trends or to the bad times ahead that these pieces of data tend to point to. And I, you know, I hate to start off the week on such a bummer. I guess it's better than ending the week on a bummer and, and uh, preoccupying ourselves over the weekend. Uh, as always, I am truly dedicated to making sure that the time you spend with me on this show is repaid 
Many times over in terms of the interesting information that we share and discuss, I hope today has been a great example of that. Uh, Thanks again for listening, everybody. I'll talk to you all next time.